Well, it's a pleasure being with you all here today. Thank you for coming out at 10 in the morning. I can't believe it. There's music this evening, so we disambiguated and they put me at 10 in the morning, but that's good. Um, let me just start by saying, jumping in and saying, I'm, I'm, I usually talk about Syria, but enough of Syria. We're going to do great power rivalry in the Middle East. This is what everybody is talking about, certainly in the CIA and everything else. A recruiter for the Defense Intelligence Agency, an old student of mine, came to the University of Oklahoma and he said, tell all your students not to say Middle East, say great power rivalry. So I, I'm glad to say, uh, to announce to you that I am on the cutting edge. <laughs> now here, just last week, Bill Burns, the head of the CIA, um, gave a talk about great power rivalry in the Middle East, and he said, it is a world in which the US is no longer the only big kid on the geopolitical block. The weight of the hedging middle is growing. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today, is the hedging middle. And in particular, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, which are the two big economic powers in the Middle East and traditional allies of the United States, and how they have begun to move towards China uh, and out of the U.S.'s orbit. Um, these countries, he said, see little benefit and lots of risk in monogamous geopolitical relationships. And his use of the word monogamous was well chosen because there are a few Saudi um, commentators who've used this sort of tongue in cheek about the polygamous relationship that Saudi Arabia is now searching for. Uh, although they love the United States, they're looking for other partners as well. And they say this a little bit uh, to mock America, I guess, because we're constantly criticizing them for polygamy. So, it, but he used that word, I think, very specifically because it's been used quite a bit in the newspapers. Now, let me just give you a big picture of relative decline for the United States. The United States is still the biggest economy in the world. It's by far the biggest military, as we know. But relative decline, meaning that we're not in decline, but the rest of the world is growing so rapidly that in relationship to the rest of the world, we are in decline. And we look at this, you know, you can see that in 1960, the U.S. had 40% of global GDP. Phenomenal, it was 50% after World War II because of course Europe and everywhere else was on their knees. And that has gone down. You know, fortunately it's only 24%, which is still pretty damn good. But as you can see, the rest of the world is screaming up and China uh, is growing you know, tremendously and we're gonna get into that. Um, here is another graph to help you visualize this change in relative power. The United States is by far still the biggest economy in total output in both trade, manufacturers, and services. Services are very important because that's what China doesn't have so much. We have banking, we have entertainment. If you think of all the movies and everything, we have, we have tons of services that the rest of the world doesn't provide where we dominate. But in terms of manufacturing and so forth, China is going to be, is, is screened ahead. And you can see with the manufacturing, China, $2 trillion or 20% of world industrial output. The United States is only 18%. The next, Japan, 10%, Germany, 700 billion, which is like 7%, and it goes down from there pretty rapidly. Um, but in terms of, you can see where, and I'm gonna, Saudi Arabia is here, and UAE and Qatar are right here. So that's our Middle East, and Israel, of course, is big as well. That's the, the Middle East region uh, that we're talking about, which is not a giant share of world power, but they're middling powers that will, that have been very closely allied to the United States and dominated by US trade until recently. Here is, if we take the same stuff, but we put it in 
purchasing power parity, what they call, is it, an exchange rate. If you use an exchange rate between a dollar and foreign currencies based on what you could buy, the same basket of goods, then China comes up much more strongly because the Chinese currency is uh, weak compared to the dollar. They've kept it low, but it can buy a lot in China. So that's another measure, and here you see China moving ahead, and both the EU and the United States coming down, and um, the Middle East region is pretty, is, is not doing well. The Middle East, by and large, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf are doing very well. They're growing at breakneck pace, but countries like Iraq, Syria, Iran, so forth, have not been doing well, and, uh, and that's what brings their numbers down. So, we're just going to talk about these two countries. Here is a picture of MBZ and uh, MBS. MBZ, Mohammed bin Zayed, is the leader of the United Arab Emirates. He's older, he's been on the pot longer, and, uh, and here's the Saudi crown prince, MBS Mohammed bin Salman. His father is still the king, but he's very aged and infirm. So it's really, since 2017, it's been MBS. He came to the pot about at the age of 30, he's now 37. He is a dominant power, very full of himself in many ways, according to America. And, uh, but the Saudi youth and Saudis love him. He's changed Saudi dramatically from concentrating the Wahhabi religion, and he got rid of He's given women the right to drive and the right to work and to have their own passports and so forth. Um, movie theaters have been opened. He's really opened up Saudi society. And he looks to MBS, uh, MBZ, really as a role model and what the UAE has been doing. Manar and I just spent a week in the UAE um, over spring break in March, and I went to talk to an Israeli, it was an organization run by an Israeli Russian, but it was to Russian businessmen. There were about 100 very wealthy Russian businessmen who were moving their families and their businesses to the United Arab Emirates. The United Arab Emirates is the number one destination for new businesses and for world, it's the easiest world trade. You can get a golden visa for 10 years uh, you don't pay taxes. There are um, minimal taxes for businesses to move to UAE, and it's been growing at you know seven percent a year. It just everywhere we look, there are cranes. Uh, all the schools are most of the schools are in English, so even UAE kids speak in English. We talked to a few dignitaries there who were there to speak to the Russians and. Uh, they said, my kids now speak English at home uh, with friends and so forth, half in English, half in Arabic. He said, it's, it's very disconcerting to have your kids lose their culture, but if we want to be competitive, this is what we have to do. And uh, Manar and I went out with a Syrian friend who runs a business, a, a building business, a uh, building supply business in the UAE. We sat at a restaurant, and the kids in front of the restaurant playing on the beach were different from different nationalities, and they were all speaking together in English. It was really something, it was really extraordinary. Um, we asked our Syrian friend who this building supply where he gets his stuff from. He said 100% from China, everything, nothing from the United States. So anyway, that's a little anecdotal beginning to this. Um, let's look first at the UAE because it has set the model for the region. Mohammed bin Zayed rejected Biden's invitation to come to Washington earlier this year. Uh, when Biden was in Saudi Arabia, he made an announcement he didn't want MBZ to get hurt feelings, and he said, please come to Washington. MBZ has not gone to Washington, has not responded to his thing. He's been upset with the United States. Um, and has been moving his relations, or expanding relations with both Russia and China, in a sense to try to, to try to reassure his country, because he feels the United States has not 
stood up for the UAE, both against Iran and against scuds that came from Yemen, but were where Iran was behind them, that were launched both in 2019 and just 2022 into the UAE, because the UAE had joined with Saudi Arabia in attacking the Houthis in Yemen. And so Yemen tried to hit back and punish them by sending these missiles that had gotten from Iran into both countries. And, uh, and the UAE looked to the United States to do something about it. And the US didn't do anything about it. First under Trump, but then under Biden. And so that upset them tremendously. Um, but the Emirati peak with Washington began under Obama earlier, uh, once President Obama came up with his nuclear deal with Iran in 2015-16. It was done behind the backs of both Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And they felt that Obama was really abandoning them and was saying, you know, you're going to have to work this out yourselves and we're not going to choose between the two of you. We're going to keep a balance of power and we don't want to have to go to war against Iran. That was the pressing issue for the United States. We don't have to bomb Iran's nuclear facilities. Because those are the guarantees we've given to Israel. We've promised Israel that if Iran gets close to developing a bomb, we will, bomb, we will stop them from doing it. And Obama thought, we've got to stop them from doing this, and then we have to make a deal. Because otherwise, we'll be on the hook for doing military action. And he didn't like Iraq or Afghanistan, was trying to get us out of these places. The last thing he wanted to do was get us further into the Middle East. So that's the background for Obama's doing this deal with Iran. And both Saudi Arabia and the Emirates felt very badly about this. Um, Obama also called the Emiratis free riders on America's defense dollar. Um, then came the drone attacks. Uh, under Trump and Biden, and which America did very little. Technology restrictions are another problem for the UAE. The United States has a treaty or has an agreement with Israel for a qualitative uh, military edge that, that no combination of Arab countries should be able to attack Israel that Israel should be able to defeat any number of Arab nations. And that means not selling Arab nations fancy equipment that is given to Israel. And that, of course, upsets them. Uh, and they are, and it's, it drives them towards China and Russia to get missile technology and so forth. President Trump, under the Abraham Accords, which he negotiated, and the UAE was the first in spearhead of the Abraham Accords. UAE signed up for the Abraham Accords under Trump because it wanted F-35s. Those are our fancy jets that are, you know, that are radar escaping and so forth. And normally we said no, but Trump said yes, if you sign peace with Israel, and he worked it out with Israel. When Biden came along, and the, with the congressional pressure, they stopped the sale and, uh, of these arms. And so, which has caused, it hasn't caused the UAE to turn away from Israel. Israel, uh, UAE is working with Israel. There were tons of Israeli businessmen who had already moved their businesses to the UAE when I was there. And I talked to a bunch of Israeli Russians who were saying that they're also bringing Israelis because it's a good tax shelter, you can trade with everybody, you don't have the Israeli imprint, which, which stumbles trades as part of the Middle East. And so Israelis are moving also. And the UAE is continuing that relationship, although it got upset with the United States for not carrying through with this arms deal. So the UAE has turned to French fighters, UAE fighters, that it's looking at. Uh, it hasn't, it's bought some, but it's really, it's looking for this next tier of technology, because it wants to be at the top. Uh, and that, for that, it's turned towards China. Um, and they're, they're worried about their economic growth. So let's look at a few numbers for the UAE. 
The UAE is the Arab world's number two largest economy. It's growing at 7.6% this year and has been growing at breakneck pace for a number of years. It will double the size of its economy by 2031. Now, it's only a nation of 10 million people, and 8 million of those people are foreign nationals who work there. Indians and, oh, from all over the world. Young, enterprising people are moving to the UAE in droves. As we said, we went out to dinner with our Syrian friend during the Syrian civil war. Every really well-educated Syrian tried to get to the UAE to start a business, to be a doctor, to whatever. The same thing happened in Iraq once America invaded and the country fell apart. All the upper middle class tries to get to the Gulf. And the UAE has been very accommodating. So they've got tons of Palestinians, they, tons of Iranians. 10% of their businessmen are Iranians who left after the Iranian revolution have gone to UAE. So the UAE has really been able to cannibalize all of the upper middle class in the Middle East, particularly to the countries where America has laid waste to the economies. So it's been a very profitable, but it means you have people who are angry at America in the country as well. Um, the UAE is China's second largest economic partner in the Middle East after Saudi Arabia. Bilateral trade between the US and the UAE, um, 23 billion roughly. China's 75 billion. So it's three times larger. Uh, it's projected to hit 200 billion by 2030. There have been tons of trade missions back and forth and they're trying to, um, anyway, 6,000 Chinese businesses operate in the UAE and many of them have their headquarters in the UAE for the Middle East because it's such a, it's such a, uh, a good place to do business. So you can see 20 years ago, the United States trade dominated the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Today, it's China trade. And that, of course, it sets the foundation. We don't even have to believe in Marx to realize that the economy is what drives things. Um, OK, this is a bit overcrowded here. High technology for the UAE. If we just go and look at a few things, the UAE, um, began to, the, China began to build a port in the UAE and a military, um, a military base in the UAE. America got furious, made them stop it about two years ago, but just this year they discovered that the base is once again active and China is building things. Um, and despite Emirati assurances, to the contrary, the U.S. detected renewed activity in building a People's Liberation Army logistics site on this base, so they seem to be moving ahead. Um, the Emirates uh, rejected U.S. entreaties to close China's telecoms giant Huawei. This has been the major struggle with a lot of Arab countries, is they want to go Huawei. It's much cheaper to get their 5G. The trouble is America sees it really as a stalking horse for Chinese intelligence and military power because it allows, America believes that it allows China to listen in on all these conversations and also to spy on American bases. So with increased activity with China, space exploration, which both the UAE and Saudi are getting in with with China to send up rockets and satellite systems for the UAE. Um, there's a lot of sharing of intelligence with China. So America, which has been working closely with both these countries as a center for their defensive agreements in the Middle East, are getting tons of intelligence from America. And we believe they're, just, you know, they're sharing it with China, either intentionally or unintentionally, because China is beginning to develop all of this communications network in both kingdoms. Um, Growing partnership between intelligence agencies is a serious challenge. The US, China, and the UAE agreed to cooperate on a, a rover for lunar South Pole exploration. So both countries, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, are very interested in space exploration and rocketry and missiles. And China offers them that technology. The United States has refused to give them any of that technology. So they're going elsewhere because they can. Uh, why wouldn't they? So that's, America's gonna have a hard time dealing with them. 
During the Cold War, if you think of Nasser, others, we could smush them if they wandered away and tried to become non-aligned people like Tito and Cuba and Egypt. We could really come down on them like a ton of bricks. Today, it's not clear that we can do that because they really have alternatives. And our military power, we can't just overthrow countries. We could overthrow the Iranian regime in 1953, which we did, for $3 million. It was the great triumph of the CIA. Today, we've been trying to overthrow the Iranian regime for decades, and we've spent you know, millions of dollars on this, uh, convincing other countries not to trade with them, to follow our sanctions, all this sort of thing. Uh, has cost us a lot of money, and we can't do it. We haven't been successful. So it just shows you the relative power of those two periods. Um, not only that, but the UAE has been busting sanctions on Russia. You know, they're letting all these people in. I mentioned to a friend um, who works in the National Security Council, just a few weeks ago, I went down to talk to the head of the Middle East guy and Gulf person. And he said, when I told him when I've been to the UAE and talked to others, he said, oh, you're helping them bust sanctions. You know, that's what is on their mind, is the way that the UAE has been, uh, has been cooperating. For example, the value of electronic parts shipped from the UAE to Russia increased by a factor of sevenfold from 2021 to 2022. So once sanctions were placed on Russia, they began getting all their chips through the UAE. Uh, a load of Iranian drones was shipped to the UAE and then transshipped to Russia. So UAE has been helping Russia in all kinds of ways fight its war because it sees it as this is an opportunity. This is business. And um, OK. Let me switch and touch on Saudi Arabia for a few minutes before we close here. Um, President Trump doubled down on the relationship, the traditional good relationship with Saudi Arabia. As we know, his son-in-law spearheaded this effort. And it was a very simple exchange to get Abraham Accords going. If Israel would help, if, if Saudi Arabia would help Israel with its Palestinian problem, the United States would, Trump would stop the Iran deal, nuclear deal, which he called the worst deal ever. And he did. He also moved the embassy to Jerusalem. He recognized the Golan Heights were Israeli and so forth. And this, um, and the Saudis said nothing. They helped smooth over this recognition of what had really become de facto reality in the Middle East. And the Saudis went along with it because they thought America was going to come down on Iran hard and squeeze them and break them. Um, and that was the basis of this plan. And mu much of the Gulf leadership of the Gulf country believes that Palestinians are never going to get a state. This is a finished problem, sort of like the Mexican-American War, where you finally have to say, you know, Texas and New Mexico are never going to go back, and let's get over it. And that was the basis for this. <coughs> then came Abqi. Um, Iran struck Saudi's biggest refinery, oil refinery, 50%, roughly 50% of its oil refinery was stopped for about a week because its missiles and, um, hit this big refinery. Saudi Arabia immediately looked to President Trump to do something about it. President Trump threw up his hands and said, we'll sell you more Patriot missiles and other things that didn't work to stop these, but we can help you build up your technology so you can and Saudi Arabia was furious. They wanted America to strike Iran and to send a message that we're defending United, Saudi Arabia. They're a key partner. And, and we didn't do it. Then, in the presidential race, President Biden took on Saudi Arabia. 
because he saw it as the baby of Trump. So in order to try to run against Trump, he immediately called MBS uh, a pariah, said he would treat Saudi Arabia as a pariah. Now we have to remember, this is just after the killing of the Saudi journalist who was also American citizen, Khashoggi. And so America had turned, and the Democratic Party had really turned against Saudi Arabia. So he played to his base. He said, we're going to treat Saudi Arabia as a pariah, and I won't sell them any more arms, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to stop the Yemeni war, which America had supported Saudi Arabia and the UAE in that. And of course, as soon as he became president, he had to reverse course on that and go back for the famous visit and the, the fist pump with, uh, with MBS, because Saudi Arabia is important. We can't turn our backs on Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the key engine to OPEC. It exports more oil than any other country. It exports, it produces the same amount of oil as Saudi Arabia, as uh, Russia. America has surpassed it. Saudi Arabia is about 10 million barrels a day. The United States is 12 million barrels a day. But uh, because it's a small country in terms of population, it exports 7 million barrels of oil a day. And that means it can flood the market or restrict it, and it's the head of OPEC. And a US relationship with Saudi Arabia has been built on being able to influence Saudi production. And Saudi has usually changed its production levels according to the wishes of the United States president. It's not always. There's always a negotiation. But the basic change has been security for Saudi Arabia, and you give us, you know, cheaper oil. And we'll work out our relationship with you on supply of oil. And presidents generally ask for more production of oil before elections. Brings down the price of oil, brings down inflation, everything runs smoothly, and the Saudis do this for the beauty of America because they get arms and the other, other goodies in exchange for that. Biden asked Saudi Arabia to do just that just before midterm elections. Remember, inflation was at 10% and the Republicans were beating up on Biden. So he said, look, it, help us bring down inflation, bring down oil prices before the elections. That'll help me and we'll help you. The Saudi said, no, we're not going to do it. They raised, in fact, they reduced because they were worried that China economy was slowing, the world economy was slowing, they were worried that prices would fall, and Saudi Arabia uh, did just the opposite of what America wanted. And of course, it's working closely with Russia. Russia is now, at, you know, they call it OPEC plus. Russia is a part of OPEC and negotiates with Russia to keep supply and prices at a, at a good, what they consider to be the optimal price, uh, price. America can't do that. Even though we're the biggest supplier, because we don't have a state-controlled oil system, because we have a capitalist system, it's always boom and bust. All of those wells in Texas and Oklahoma, the government can't control how much they're taking out of the ground. So they take out of the ground, expand, expand, expand until the price collapses, and then everybody goes bankrupt, and they get thrown out of their jobs in Oklahoma and Texas, and they have to wait a decade for it to come back, and then they get back in. But they cannot manage it because it's a free market system. The rest of the world doesn't have a free market system and they can manage it. All right, I get a little off track here, but so Saudi Arabia and American relations went from bad to worse over this period and they're pretty bad now, but Saudi Arabia has choices. It feels like it has choices. And um, this led to China coming up with a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, understanding that America was not going to bomb Iran and that sanctions weren't working, began to look, uh, began to try to balance, to hedge against a possible Iranian war or Iranian further attacks at Abu Ghraib. Or if Israel were to bomb Iran, Iran has promised that it would attack Saudi Arabia first because that's the weak link. Saudi Arabia can't really defend itself so well, and to drive up oil prices. So it's, a, it's an effort to scare America into not allowing Israel to bomb Iran's nuclear plants. Because 
Iran has said, we are going to close the Straits of Hormuz and we will disrupt oil exports through the Persian Gulf. And that will drive the price of oil through the roof, 200, 300%, and it will crash the American economy. And so we'll screw you if you screw us. That's the basic idea. But Saudi Arabia is, at the, is the vulnerable partner here. So Saudi Arabia doesn't want that to happen. So it needs to make peace with Iran because America isn't going to bomb Iran and defend it. So China swept in, and China has very close relations with Iran, has been the major power that has been, until recently, as it has gone along with American sanctions on Iran. But in the last year and two, it's begun to take more Iranian oil and help Iran get it out. Um, if you remember, a few years ago, the number two of Huawei, the daughter of the CEO of Huawei, who was the chief financial officer, was arrested in Canada. America asked her to be arrested and delivered to the United States. Why? Because she was breaking sanctions on Iran. She had helped develop shell companies for Huawei and was building out Iran's 5G network. And America said, you couldn't do that. China said, yes, we can, because you're, you cannot tell us who to sanction. So Trump asked for her to be arrested when she was transiting Canada on a flight. And Canada did it because they're nice to America. And then China immediately arrested two or three major Chinese uh, two Canadian businessmen in China and held them hostage. Said, you, you, if you don't let go of this CEO, CFO, uh, we won't let go of you. And China, finally Canada let him go. But that's a kind of, that's a kind of arm twisting that America has done for the sanctions on Iran. Uh, and they weren't working. You know, China began to push back and China then began to take oil. I said, screw you, we're going to take oil from Iran. So that's been, so China had good offices with Iran and good offices with Saudi Arabia. And it wanted peace between these two sides because it wants to trade. And so it negotiated a peace agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia that was announced just you know, earlier this year. And it flummoxed Washington. The whole world began to go, oh wow, China has arrived as a peacemaker in the Middle East. And many Arabs were saying, well, America's a war maker in the Middle East, but China's the peacemaker. And it was a bad look for the United States. The US immediately said, no, we're very happy with this peace. We were the ones who really started it with negotiations in Iraq and blah, blah, blah. But of course, having China swoop in and get the, get the big photo op was not a, was not a good thing. Um, It's important to mention in the middle, for MBS, Vision 2030, his new plan for building Saudi Arabia and its future is key to how he thinks about all this and why he is moving towards China and Russia and leaving this monogamous relationship with the United States. And that's because he's worried that Saudi Arabia is just tied to petrochemicals, that once they run out, um, Saudi Arabia we left back in the desert. So he's trying to change Saudi's economy to be a modern economy, diversified from oil and gas. In order to do that, he needs trade. And he's really copying MBS, uh, MBZ, except, excuse me, in UAE. He wants that kind of dynamic international economy with tourism, so he's opened Saudi Arabia up to tourism. He's said that the Saudi Airlines is going to be as big as the Emirati Airlines, and we're going to be the real entrepot and tourist hub of this entire region. He has told um, Chinese businesses and other foreign businesses that are centered in the UAE that if they want to trade with Saudi Arabia, they're going to have to move their offices to Saudi Arabia. So he's taking on, and it, this has increased tensions with MBZ, with the Emirates, but he's looking to that same model. Instead of the Wahhabi model of conservative Islam, he's really broken away from that and said, that's yesterday, we don't want to be that. He stopped funding all these Saudi schools abroad. 
that did fire up terrorism. I mean, it's good for the United States, it's good for the world that he's adopted this kind of vision of a futuristic, more equality between women and men, getting Saudi integrated into the world, not being this sort of hermit kingdom, and, um, and allowing people to come in and out. Now, of course, it's meant centralizing power around himself. And he's thrown many people into jail and shaken them down, and he's let people know. He's become much more dictatorial and much more like other Middle Eastern autocracies, if you will. Um, but he's extremely popular in Saudi Arabia. And part of his popularity comes from the fact that he's sticking America in the eye every once in a while. And, and he's let Biden and others know that they can't dictate to the Saudi Arabia anymore. Um, let's just look at popular polls. There have been a number of popular uh, polls for opinions of Arab point of view. And, and uh, there was a series done on young Arabs under the age of 29. Uh, one poll, poll reported that 80% of young Arabs viewed China as an ally, and the U.S. ranked number seven. Russia is regarded as a tap, uh, top ally by 70% of young people. 50% of young Arabs regard the U.S. as an enemy rather than an ally, according to a BBC poll of young people. In another poll, People in five different countries, including the UAE, Egypt, and Jordan, all very close allies of the United States, um, expressed greater confidence in Russia than in the United States. Um, many accused the US and the EU of a double standards. They said, they pointed to you know, very proactive response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Whereas they say, when Israel has taken Jerusalem or the Golan Heights and annexed or taken much of the West Bank, the uh, United States does nothing. So for its allies, it's willing to close its eyes to the rule-based order of the world that it's constantly talking about, but for its enemies, it doesn't. Um, and many Arabs argued in, that the invasion of Ukraine is no worse than the US invasion of Iraq. Um, okay, the U.S., now I've, I've painted this picture of U.S. decline in the Middle East, but let's correct that a little bit. The U.S. remains the dominant military power in the Middle East and military supplier of choice. There are 30 U.S. bases in the narrow Middle East, this is not including Pakistan and so forth, and about 30,000 troops in the Middle East today, which has been drawn down considerably. About four years ago, there were 60,000. The US share of the regional arms market has increased from 47% in 2010-14 to 54% more recently. The costs of, okay, and, and then you can contrast that with the, the amount of money America has spent on military in the Middle East over the last 20 years. Since the war on terror, the US has spent, uh, according to this Costs of War project by Brown University, has spent $8 trillion in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, other places. Uh, and there have been 900,000 deaths. Now that's not just deaths from shooting. That's deaths from collateral, from the destruction of medical provisions, lack of food. The, you know, so when Iraq fell apart and was in the middle of civil war, this is the actuarial tables of the population of Iraq and what it should have been and what it hasn't been. So it, it's exaggerating America's direct responsibility for all of this, but it's trying to get a, beyond just who was shot. Um, and that, of course, has produced a great deal of resentment um, in the Middle East, in a sense that that's underlying those popular polls where people are blaming the United States. Um, China's military in the Middle East is really not there. They have a base in Djibouti, um, just at the horn with, uh, you can see, Yemen is just across the way. Here's Yemen, here's Djibouti. 
And this is the Russian base that they're building here. That's one of eight Russian bases in the world, as opposed to almost 700 American bases. And here's the American base. There's a Japanese base and a French base right next to it. But, so they're both watching over this. And China does it to police the pirates that are stopping its trade that's going through the Red Sea and up into the Mediterranean. Um, but uh, another thing that's worth talking about is that um, six Arab countries have become dialogue partners and are trying to join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. That is China's answer to NATO, if you will. It's about defensive cooperation, in, mostly in Central Asia, but also moving through Asia. And Many Middle Eastern countries have signed up to join that. Iran has signed up to join it. Russia is a member. So America sees this as, a, as this counterbalance. Um, and they're all joining. They want to join China and get the high technology that they can get. So let's turn to conclusions here. US partners in the Middle East are no longer satisfied with Washington's attempts to create exclusive US-led blocs. They're seeking alternatives and to diversify their partners. China is the dominant economic power in the Middle East today. Um, China's foreign policy tends to be friendlier to authoritarian regimes. If you think of in the war against Ukraine, or Russia and Ukraine, America has cast this as democracies versus autocracies, and has tried to line up the democracies of the world against the autocracies. And for the Middle Eastern countries, all of which are autocracies, it's pretty easy to see which side you should be lined up on, because maybe you'll be sanctioned next. And um, the Biden threat to treat Saudi Arabia as a pariah sent you know, a shiver of anxiety through the Gulf, thinking maybe we could be sanctioned, maybe we could be on that bad side of the ledger. So China doesn't ask questions in its diplomacy. It's like the United States used to be in the 1950s, when Britain was the colonial power in the Middle East. Britain was going Suez, it was trying to overturn the Iranian government, it was, it was playing the tough guy, trying to keep its military bases. And the United States could just trade. Free trade, it didn't have a military presence in the Middle East, and everybody loved the United States. Uh, that was the age in which, partly the age in which I grew up in, in the Middle East, where my father opened the first US bank in Saudi Arabia in 1958, and, uh, in Jeddah, and he never had a bad loan in his four years in Saudi Arabia, because he, it was the whole world liked the United States, because we were not a colonial power. And in a way, China is like that today. And America has become more like Great Britain after World War II, uh, a, a, a retreating power that's trying to hold on to its military position in the Middle East. Um, China's foreign policy tends to be friendlier, yes. U.S. history of wars in the region has turned public opinion against the U.S. U.S.'s lower profile in the Middle East, you can argue, has been good. Good for diplomacy, good for peacemaking. The peace with Iran has come from the fact that America has withdrawn a bit and said, we're not going to go to war against Iran for you. Therefore, Saudi Arabia has to find another way. And that means a painful dialogue for itself and to make compromises. And now those compromises have come with now peace negotiations for Yemen are much closer than they've ever been because Iran and Saudi Arabia are sitting down together to talk about it. Syria has just been brought back into the Arab League, much to America's chagrin, but led by Saudi Arabia and the UAE, who say, we're not going to win against Iran in Syria. We can't fight that war. Even though America would like us to continue fighting it in Syria, we're not going to do that because we need economic growth. And if Saudi Arabia is to reach its 2030 plan of rapid economic growth, it can't have scuds coming in from Yemen. It can't have disruptions. It needs tourism. It needs to be secure and safe place for businesses. 
And that's a positive future. And you can say that America's retreat from the Middle East is allowing some of this. There are going to be less wars and more diplomacy. And on that note, I will end the talk. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that was, that was uh, about 40 minutes. We've got about 15 minutes for some questions and so forth. What about the whole human rights issue in some of these countries? I mean, we have sort of stood firm on those that that has to be a primary consideration, and yet everything you said is that their growth is really based purely on business and economics and... and human rights the take the hindmost. ...or down there somewhere. I think you're absolutely right. A multipolar system means that you're constantly in competition. And if America takes its human rights agenda, like it did Biden during the election cycle, accusing Saudi Arabia of being a human rights offender for killing Khashoggi, uh, he couldn't make good on that. He needed that relationship much more. And Saudi Arabia showed that it was willing to turn to China and so forth. And especially after the invasion of Ukraine, where we needed our allies to line up with us and to not help Saudi, uh, not help Russia escape from sanctions and oil and so forth, we couldn't, um, we couldn't move ahead on those human rights um, demands. Yeah. Would you think that based upon what you said, the Israeli uh, lead in cybersecurity would be moving through the UAE. It is. And moving up towards Russia and, and by, by extension, China. Um, yes, I think it is. I mean, that's obviously a worry because there are a hundred ways to get advanced technology now. And Israel has, you know, Israel is a partner with America on all the missile systems and so forth. So the Abraham Accords, of course, it's very leaky. But Israel, for a long time, has been working with China on missile technology, um, you know, for the last 20 years. Uh, America has been very worried about that and constantly reminding them not to do too much. China was going to build the port of Haifa about four years ago, uh, had put in the winning bid, and, and Israel was, had moved ahead to allow China to build. America said, you can't do it because we've got a port, we've got military place right next door. Israel backed down. So Israel has stayed away from Huawei. Uh, Jordan, also an American ally, just chose the Finnish, um, a Finnish uh, telephone company to help it build its system and was going to go Huawei, but America put pressure on it. So those are negotiations that are constantly going on. But you're right. Um, Israel and the UAE and Saudi Arabia are beginning to work particularly the UAE, are beginning to work closely on that kind of technology, particularly miss missile technology, which, um, and getting, so, you know, that is a way that technology gets to, but Turkey, Turkey just signed a $50 billion deal with Saudi Arabia for drones and other high technology. Turkey is a big center of military um, arms, advanced arms industry. They're building their own jet fighter now. They're trying to. And so more and more companies want to get onto that um, gravy train, and especially missile technology, to put up their own satellite systems so that they can have an independent intelligence that's not totally dependent on the United States. And so they're reaching to all the com countries that do that. Yeah. Yeah, Tom. Sounds like an amazing, uh, complex chess game with kings and queens and bishops and knights and pawns. And I wonder, you know, chess is accessible to artificial intelligence. And uh, computers have been designed that can basically win any chess game. Right. Do you think any of the major players ha are working artificial intelligence models of all of this and sort of figuring out what might happen, what's the best move, best next move? Um, absolutely. You know, war games, yeah. Washington is constantly asking all these Middle Eastern experts to come and play these war games. And, um, 
you know, it's very hard to know what people are really going to do. But when we play war games against Iran, um, Iran wins. They stop the oil and things go bad sideways very quickly. And which is one of the things that convinced us to convince Obama to try to do this nuclear deal with Iran. Um, so, yes, all this intelligence is being used all the time. I, I don't know if it's really convincing America. It, it's hard for America to give up this notion of being, you know, of being this, the supreme power. And uh, every one of our presidents runs every four years claiming America is the greatest country in the world. And I'm going to keep it the greatest country in the world. And that's one of the number one things that every American wants to hear, unfortunately. I think that's, that's driving us to bankruptcy because we've already spent $120 billion on Ukraine. We're going to spend a lot more than that. So that, that $8 trillion we just spent on the war on terror, it, it's not stopping. And we're at $32 trillion worth of debt and we're adding you know, almost a trillion a year now. So it is... And if we keep on fighting these wars, it leads us into, but Americans like it. I don't know why. I, I, I don't know if Americans like it. I think that's one of the reasons that Trump was actually popular, because he said these forever wars, and he said Iraq is the, is the Harvard of jihadism, and that George Bush did that. He criticized his own party terribly. And I think Americans like that. But the foreign policy establishment has become quite divorced from the everyday American, who wants to spend money on schools, on roads, and other things. Don't want to spend money. But um, for some reason, Washington likes to spend money abroad. Yeah, uh, here, and then here. In a, in a chess game, a pawn doesn't suddenly become a rook without you no. realizing what's about to happen. And in a chess game, there are a winner and a loser, and we don't want a world where there are losers. Well, but we do. No, we don't. Well, the trouble is, you're right. In theory, we don't. But we have a lot of losers, like Iraq or Syria. Um, we didn't set out to make them losers. But once we realized we couldn't turn them into the pro-American democracies we wanted, we, we've left them. Um, broken. If we take Syria as an example, where the Iranians and Russians have sort of won in Syria, our special envoy to Syria, our last special envoy, we don't have him right now, to Syria, said, Ambassador James Jeffrey said, my job is to turn Syria into a quagmire for Russia and Iran. Which means, if we can't have it, we're going to have it broken because we're not going to let them have it. They're not going to win this war. They're not going to win the peace, for example. And, and I think America does that not a lot. But America punishes its enemies. And it's done it more recently than in the past. And I think up until fairly recently, America was a generous country that helped Marshall Plan, helped with point four money in the Middle East, helped lots of developing countries. But more recently, there's been a lot more military action. And, and, but it's bad. It's bad for democracy. You know, sanctions on Iran have brought the average GDP in Iran have halved it in about 10 years. That can't be good for democracy. It, 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 it's good for weakening Iran and punishing it. But it's not good for democracy promotion because one of the only things we know about democracy promotion is that a higher per capita GDP helps in sticking democracy. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think I have, um, but I would say most of the time America does try to help people develop, but, but not all the time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I'm wondering, um, the conference on climate change is going to take place in, I believe, uh, uh, November in the AE. UAE, yes, United Arab Emirates. Yeah. And um, what interests me is that governments, including our government, don't make the 
connection between problems with climate change and making war. In other words, making war and preparing for war and building the instruments of war is quite devastating to, is using fossil fuels and is accelerating our crisis, which we're feeling here in Vermont now. Right. And uh, so why is it that there isn't a connection made between issues of climate change and preparing for war? You know, I just quoted Burns, head of CIA, and his speech that he makes about this, the last half of it is about climate change and about the need for America to re orient its priorities. But I think um, it's very hard to do that. It's very hard to do that uh, because Americans are stuck on being the leader. And we're fearful that without America, you know, a friend of mine when I talked about what I was going to talk about said, but you don't really want, you know, what, what's the world going to be like when America is not the leader? And that anxiety of losing control over international events is, is a powerful anxiety, I think. Because it, there is a worry that a world where China and Russia are balancers of the United States is going to be a more dangerous world. There's a world that we don't like. Um, and it keeps, you know, that does keep us from focusing on our priorities, which is no doubt about it. I mean, even the F-35, which we have here in Vermont, is not uh, added to, is, is not uh, interpreted in talking about climate change as being a major factor, and yet the amount of fossil fuel used, what is it, 22 gallons per minute, uh, right. that are as soon in our, in our skies by mm -hmm. these planes in Burlington Airport uh, is really, um, should, is really important and is a negative factor to us coming up to speed with, uh, the goals of uh, turning from fossil fuel. Right. Well, you know, that brings up the whole question of, of sort of corruption of the political process and uh, the amount of <clears throat> the industrial military complex. And if you look at the top think tanks, you know, I said it's just a study done recently, um, over 50% of the funding for most of these think tanks comes from big arms companies. and. Uh, which is perhaps one of the reasons why the foreign policy community is a little bit divorced from what the average American is worried about um, and keeps us, you know, engaged in so many bases around the world. Um, you know, I don't know the answer to your question, but it's clear that the United States isn't, even though we can recognize the danger global warming, we aren't putting the priorities and we aren't spending the money on it that we should be and we're spending it in places like the military, um, which, is, which is big. And, you know, I was just looking at numbers for Oklahoma the other day of Oklahoma. For every dollar Oklahoma gives to Washington, the federal government, it gets two dollars. And one of those, of course, Social Security is the top and so forth, but number three are veteran benefits that are gobbling up that are tax dollars because there are so many veterans who've retired in Oklahoma. It's a cheap state and it gives a lot of military people, uh, has a lot of bases. And, um, and that's the number three consumer of those tax dollars. It's just veteran affairs and health for veterans and all the benefits that veterans get. So it does consume the money in very odd ways. Let me put it that way. Yes, Tom. Uh, I think also it's a, it's a priority issue, specifically with the military. They prioritize winning, whatever that means, above everything else. It's like during World War II, when they knew what was going on with the Holocaust. They knew there were millions of Jews being killed, but they said, don't bother us with that. We've got to <laughs> we gotta win. win. Right. right. Well, winning, winning is important for everybody. We have a winning culture. You yes, you do. I'm going to have to get over that. Yes, um, one more question. If I were listening to you 30 years from now, which I won't be, you might be talking then, but uh, we 
would you be saying this about India as opposed to China and Russia? Well, you know, India has been coming up. In the United States, um, Blinken, who just went uh, to Saudi Arabia and so forth, he tried to present what he calls U2 something to it's it's United States and the United Arab Emirates. It's U2 I2 and Israel and India. And so he was promoting and claiming that India, in a sense, could could be with the United States and compete with China in the Middle East. Mm. That Israel and India and the United States with the UAE could be this sort of virtuous competitors to the China effort to... So, the United States is selling India big today. The question is, is India really going to line up with the United States? Um, and that, there's a lot of debate over whether India is the kind of democratic partner that America really is looking for, whether they can uh, do what China has done. Um, you know, I, I went on just an anecdote on that. I went to a trip to China not too long ago, and I was doing the Great Wall thing, and in the little micro bus with this Indian fellow, a pilot, sitting next to me. And so I asked him, how do you, you know, what do you make of China and its development compared to India? And he said, we need a dictator. <laughs> we need a dictator like China. What China has been able to do in its last decades, we can't even build a road around our city. We can't do this. We can't, because everybody's yelling at each other and it, it, we're too, democracy is not working, is what he was saying. And, and so he was admiring this dictatorship. Now, I don't know, I don't want to sit here and have my ending words be, be uh, an encomium for dictatorship. But obviously, India has a lot of, uh, a lot of difficulties. In, it's coming up strong, but whether it can do what China is doing is another question. And there are a lot of countries that are trying to compete with it. But America is looking to India for that counterbalance to China and uh, in its defensive agreements, economic agreements, and so forth. So India will clearly be a very major player in the future. Um, how it stacks up against China is too early to say. But thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure. <laughs>